Okay, so um, now we have an act that I call the merry pranksters of science. Uh, we, <laughs> we have uh, one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence, the legendary Marvin Minsky. We have one of the founding fathers of virtual reality, the legendary Jaron Lanier. We have one of the founding fathers of cyberspace and the internet, the legendary John Perry Barlow. And we have Lee Smolin, the founding father of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo the legendary Mr. Smolin, and they're heavy-duty guys, right? So Barlow comes over to me last night and he says, we're hijacking this thing. Oh, they're heavy-duty guys. So I said, well, what do you have in mind? He says, your format, who cares? We're throwing it out. We want four chairs across. Thank you for that vote. <laughs> and, you know, we just want to talk. So I think about it for a minute. I look at these four heavyweight guys, and I say, OK. Well, guess what? You know, when you're dealing with rambunctious kids, right? You say yes. What do they decide? No. <laughs> no. They don't want to do it that way anymore. So we're going to. <laughs> Why? Why? because the way to be rebellious now is to do it my way, right? <laughs> it would have been nice if we had had that argument because all four of us are friends, and so you would see real fighting instead, yeah, of, that's true. instead of the peaceful one that happens when strangers meet. Okay, so just, all right. Hi, I'm, I'm Jaron, uh, and it's Marvin. So first, I want I wanted to take a chance to do something in public that I've never been able to do in public before, which is thank Marvin for all he did for me when I was a really weird, awkward kid. And he, he was a tremendously important mentor to me and a wonderful inspiration. And I have, to, I have to get this phrasing just right. He showed me that I can utterly love and be grateful and respectful towards somebody with whom I disagree vastly about a vast number of things. But thank you so much for all those wonderful gifts. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, I, um, following on Marvin's evocation of Piaget, I want to ask you all to try to do something which is impossible for us because indeed our brains have changed, but I want you to imagine what it was like to be a little kid. I want you to, tr to regress. You can do it if you try. Try to imagine being a little kid and if you go back far enough, if you can imagine that state of being, there was a moment when you were a little confused about something basic. And that basic thing you were confused about was the difference between reality and imagination, reality and fantasy. Now, there's a special quality to that particular confusion, a very wonderful confusion, because if you can't tell what the difference is between what is real and what is fantastic, it's as if you're a god, because anything you imagine pops into being. Can you see that? So you can wander outside and you can say, I imagine a giant porcelain turtle, a luminous turtle, flying a mile across, flying over Toronto, singing country and western songs. And poof, this thing appears grazing the CN Tower, and tastefully. And, uh, <laughs> And what, what a marvelous ability. Now, there comes a moment in every child's life in which that confusion starts to get undone by the school of hard knocks. And suddenly, the kid realizes, oh boy, there's this other kind of reality, physical reality. That's where mom really is, and food. And <laughs> I, this other world where I was God is great, but I'm all alone in it. Now, that moment of unconfusion is a disaster. It is the most humiliating, most severe demotion that you can experience as a person because you're going from God to this helpless little pink thing that wets itself. I mean, th there's no greater distance you can fall. I mean, it's just it's this horrible thing. And so that's why kids hate it. They hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. They resist it. It takes years and years and years to just accept the thing. Then there's this other little bitter pill that comes along called, called mortality. Get past those two things, you're an adult. 
And I don't think everybody quite makes it. Perhaps none of us really fully do. It's just hard. It's not easy. Now, there's a funny thing that happened in computers, starting in the 60s a little bit, and then a lot more in the 70s, and like crazy in the 80s. And that funny thing is that we all discovered that if you let a 12-year-old kid into a computer lab, the kid magically had this facility with computers. And this was really surprising. I mean, when computer science started out, it was like nuclear research or something. These were like very elite, big, expensive machines with very you know, fancy intellectual people operating them. And then, you know, it turns out kids are good at it. What is that about? It was kind of a surprise. So uh, there, you can ask, why are they cognitively good at it? Why, are they, why do they have the skills? That's one question. But why are they interested? What's the motivation? That's another interesting question. Let me tell you my hypothesis about that. And it's the hypothesis I've used as a skeleton key for thinking about all digital things. My hypothesis is that when kids look at a computer, they suddenly see a unique, fresh, and lovely resolution to the dilemma they've had to deal with as kids. So remember, dilemma is two horns, right? So let's go over the two horns. One horn is if I'm godlike and my imagination becomes real, I'm stuck with being all alone. I'm just stuck in my head. So solipsism, but it's entertaining solipsism. The other dilemma, the other side of the horn, the other horn, the other side of the dilemma, the other horn is, wow, if other people are real and I'm not alone and I can find sustenance, um, I'm weak. Like, you know, it's conceivable you could grow up and become a great engineer and a great architect and a great political force and somehow raise the funding and develop the technologies to make the giant porcelain turtle, right? But what a pain in the butt. You know, it's not that you're totally weak as a real human, it's just that you're pretty weak. So they look at these two and both of them sort of stink. But the computer, especially if you think of it as virtual reality, as an imaginary place, provides for the first time a path right through the two horns. Because let's say in the fully, what I think of as a fully blown version of a computer in virtual reality, you have a place that's shared between people just like the real world. It's objectively there. It's between people just like the physical world. But it's fluid and subject to the whims of imagination. You get both things at once you walk right through the horns. The kids who've encountered computers are the first kids in history to enjoy that. That's the special thing about them. That, to my mind, is the reason why it's worth trying to figure out how to make these things better. That's the magical quality of computers. Now, I want to leave human children aside for a second, and I want you to consider an entirely different species, a remarkable species, and that species is called the giant cuttlefish, OK? Now, a cuttlefish is a cephalopod. A cephalopod is an octopus, a squid, a tentacled thing. I'm sort of gradually turning into one myself, <laughs> at least I hope, as, as you'll see. Now, the giant cuttlefish lives in the South Pacific. Giant, in this case, it's not like a giant squid, which would fill the room here. It's about a meter. It's like this. You might have gone diving, and you might have noticed that there are octopus and squid around in the world that can change colors. Have any of you seen that? Now, the way that works is they have cells in their skin called chromatophores. And each chromatophore has its own pigment. Some are red, some are green. And if all the red ones expand rapidly and the green ones contract, suddenly the animal looks red. It's a wonderful system. Now, in the case of the giant cuttlefish, there's an individual neural path to each chromatophore. So what it has is over its whole body a bitmap display. OK? It's a good display. It can update at about 40 hertz. It runs all the way to the tips of its tentacles. It has excellent contrast, color gamut. It's about as good as a laptop display. It's excellent. And it can show whatever it wants on it. All right? Furthermore. It has a network of muscles under its skin that it can raise into different shapes. So it can change its shape with incredible fluidity. Watching this thing is very strange. I show videos of this animal to people, and people don't believe it's real. They say, that's computer graphics. And in fact, it was only photo documented after computer morphing became common. And so that's why it's not famous, because nobody believes it. But it is real. So you can watch this thing that can display whatever it wants, and it can change shape. Now, you might ask, what's the function of that? What does it do with this wild capability? Well, I'll tell you one thing it does. It hunts. 
and it hunts in this wonderful way. What, um, the cephalopods are the other channel of evolution making smart, soft creatures on this planet. They made the same trade-off that we did. They gave up their armor, but they have to get clever to make up for it. They descended from mollusks. They're part of the mollusk family, so they're really different. All the other smart animals on this planet are, are vertebrates. You know, the whales and the smart birds and all that, they're just our cousins. The cephalopods are the smart things that are the closest to aliens we can ever meet here. So it makes them really quite wonderful and precious. So the giant cuttlefish likes to eat these giant crabs. And the giant crabs have, you know, big crab armor, and they're rather vicious themselves. So how does a soft thing attack an armored thing? Well, here's what happens. The giant cuttlefish comes up upon the giant crab. The crab senses the cuttlefish, and it does this thing where it goes into crab karate attack, you know, defense posture number one. It goes, <laughs> so this is this thing they do when threatened. <laughs> the, the cuttlefish looks at the crab, utterly unimpressed. In the next moment, it does something extraordinary. It puts on a psychedelic light show. We're suddenly in the Grateful Dead or something. Go, <laughs> and you can look at this crab going, huh? <laughs> and <laughs> at that, at that moment, the cuttlefish pounces and gets a meal. Now, in technology circles, we call this giving a demo. <laughs> now, hunting is not the only use of this display capability. What's really remarkable is they communicate using it. They, now, how, determining whether an animal is using an exotic form of communication is no easy thing to do. And it requires endless amounts of, of, of observation, and we've done things like making tanks with displays on them to try to communicate with them. Nothing is quite certain about this. There's a tentative dictionary of about 90 proposed symbol systems that's, that cuttlefish use to animate to each other, to communicate about, well, you know, food, sex, fighting, blah, blah, normal stuff. The same thing television concerns itself with today. Uh, now, um, I'm telling you about this wonderful creature because I have this extraordinary sense of jealousy, I suppose. I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're a cuttlefish kid, you don't have the same dilemma a human kid has. If you want to, you know, if you imagine something, you can just become the thing, right? You can morph into whatever it is. Now, there's an interesting question to ask, which is, why don't they do that? Like, why are they so smart? And they are incredibly smart. They have wonderful minds for three-dimensional thinking, and they're strategists, and they even exhibit the beginnings of theory of mind, which is awareness of other agents in a situation. They're just wild. So why aren't they running the planet? And there's an interesting answer to that. They don't have childhood. They're born from eggs, and they have to fend for themselves by instinct. So without childhood, they don't have the chance to develop culture and to pass along an accumulated, improving um, wisdom and sense of things from generation to generation. So their gifts only come from Darwin, not, not from each other. They, they don't have a culture. So that's their, their, uh, that's their limitation. If they did have childhood, if they nurtured their young, I am convinced they'd be running the planet. Their, 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 their basic neural machinery seems to be better, actually. But that's, that's where they end. Now, what I want to propose is that the, the fundamental and most important purpose of digital technology, and perhaps technology in general, aside from survival, is to turn people into cuttlefish, but cuttlefish with childhood. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's an easy to understand concept, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> Let me try another angle on this idea. <laughs> I'm just going to try to make this very basic and simple and try to leave out all the exotic stuff. Let's suppose there were super intelligent alien cephalopods, all right? <laughs> and they visited us on their spaceship. And their job was to send a report back home about what they discovered, to report on the state of this weird species called humanity. What might they say? So here's what I think they would say. I think they would say, it's kind of sad, really. This is a species that seems to exhibit theory of mind. They seem to communicate. They seem to do all these things. They seem to be aware of each other. But you know, 
their state of being is so limited. It's like we get frustrated even watching them. Let me give you a picture of how their lives work. First of all, they don't live very long. In their whole lives, they're within these sacks of skin separated by feet of air. And they can't change the shape of the sack. It's fixed. I know, I know, you're wondering how do they communicate. Okay, now this part is going to get gross. <laughs> All right, there's this orifice, okay? It's an orifice they use for breathing air, but they also use it for eating food. Like, Aah! no, 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 it gets worse, it gets worse. <laughs> they can make these sounds with this orifice. And they have this system they call symbols where they vary the sounds and then another one can hear the sounds and they kind of figure out what they mean because they kind of have an agreement on what the sounds mean. They're like, you mean they make sounds to the same orifice they eat with? <laughs> but then after being grossed out, the next, the next reaction is, oh God, that is sad. They really are isolated from one another. That must be really lonely. Now, see, I think there's an interesting perspective you can get from considering alien cuttlefish, and that perspective gives you sort of an, I would say, an alternate ramp of history. Now, here's what I mean by ramp of history. We, we all think of ourselves as being within the society in which things change as time goes on. We're not in some eternal cyclic cosmos here. The notion is technology gets better, things change. And so all of us have a sense of the past where, you know, perhaps a good starting point is fire in the wheel, and then, you know, you have Gutenberg, and then you have, I don't know, steam engine, you know, all these, and then that goes into the future, and you get, depending on what you believe, you either get the Jetsons or lots of microscopic people or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> And, and so, you, so th that's like this cosmos that I would say is sort of the normative, the most commonly held idea about the world we, li we live in. But I think thinking about alien cuttlefish gives you an alternate ramp to think about. And that's a ramp in which people have been trying to figure out ways of getting around the interpersonal gap. All right? And so in that ramp, the first thing is language. Way at the and what is language? Well, from the perspective of a cuttlefish, language is a trick or a hack to use computer lingo. It's a hack where you use the little part of yourself that you can more flexibly, which is your tongue and your hands to a lesser degree, to refer to the rest of the universe you're not powerful enough to be in charge of. Okay? It's a little trick. So the symbol is a little hack where you, you just have your little tiny cuttlefish part and you make the best of it. Shut up, Arlo, it's annoying. All right. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's all good. No, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> what the, the irony is good stuff can be annoying. Yeah, so, all right, so. Um, <laughs> uh, so you start with language, with this hack, where you use your little cuttlefish part to refer to the rest, then you're building, 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 then you have reading and writing. Now let's think about reading and writing. This is a wild case, because um, there's a thing called an fMRI machine, and it's like the MRI you go into for medicine, but it's just a higher grade one, and you can watch where blood flows around in the brain to see which part of your brain is active when you do different things. And if you have somebody go into one of those things and read or write, you see characteristic little parts light up, and you can say, well, those are the common centers for reading and writing. But then, if you look at genetic data, and if you look at ancient skulls, you discover that people's brains haven't really changed genetically since well before reading and writing were invented. So this would appear to present a conundrum, wouldn't it? Somehow or other, the standard center of the brain exists for doing this, these things, reading and writing, but it predated them. How can that be? Well, the way it can be is that the very design of reading and writing were opportunistic for latent capability in the brain, right? So this is, this is the purest example of creativity in people, of finding this hidden, this hidden potential that might have been left under discovered, un undiscovered and yet building from it this wonderful thing we know as reading and writing. I don't believe that's the last time that can happen. That's the nature of progress along this particular ramp. This particular ramp includes technological ingenuity. It includes being able to do new tricks. But the fundamental part of it is sort of a software thing. It's like figuring out clever ways to 
build more depth out of what's already there in the brain, what's already there in culture. I think when we see these 12-year-old kids with their fascination and capability on computers, we're seeing this process beginning again. We're seeing the invention of new centers in the brain. And I think it's the most marvelous thing to watch. It's just so exciting to me. Now, where does this ramp go? If the other ramp, if the other ramp heads towards Jetsons or tiny people or something, where does this ramp go? And that leads to a very interesting idea to me. There's a little philosophy book written by a guy who's a retired professor at NYU down in New York. And um, it's called Finite and Infinite Games. I don't know if any of you have run across it. Uh, it proposes there's two basic kinds of games in the world. One is a finite game, like a single game of hockey. I'll try to be Canadian in my references here. Um, and then the other kind of game is an infinite game, which would be like the whole field of hockey, which goes on forever. Right? And so what I think is interesting about this ramp of increased creativity and increased depth of meaning is that it can go on forever. I think it's an infinite sort of game. I think we can keep on doing it. Now my yellow light is on, so I have only the tiniest bit of, of uh, time left to tell you what I think that might be like. So I want to introduce to you a crazy idea which is called post-symbolic communication. So here's the notion. What if, through virtual reality, you could be like a cuttlefish in that you could change yourself, you could change the world, the whole thing was flexible and shared with other people, so it was like a huge shared, intentional, waking state dream? Does that make sense? That's the definition of virtual reality. That's what all that fuss was about, okay? Now, let's suppose you could do that. What could you do within it? Could you do something that's beyond talking as we know it? And here is the, the synthesis that I imagine where there's a new style of communication where you directly become and make the things you're talking about, bypassing symbols on some occasions. So, for instance, instead of describing the porcelain turtle, I actually would have just made it in the course of this talk. That would be post-symbolic communication. And the technological hitch that it all depends on is in part a world of little things about displays and hard computer speed and all that crap. But even more so, there's this question of how do we design the software so that people can express themselves that quickly, to invent things as fast as you think and feel, to invent the virtual world with the speed you can morph your tongue. And that, I think, is the great unsolved technological problem. I'm coming on a wonderful conclusion, so just give me a few more sentences. Um, this is what I would propose to you that this notion of ongoing, an ongoing ramp of creativity is not merely joyous, not merely fun, but it also might be necessary. And here's the model I'd like for you to think, think about. Let's suppose you have a household full of clever, technically inclined teenagers. You stick them in a house for the summer with nothing to do. What will happen? Now, I've conducted this experiment. <laughs> Both. <laughs> both as a member of the household and as an as a, uh, unwilling supervisor. And let me tell you, what happens is big trouble, <laughs> explosions, <laughs> horrible things. Um, now, <laughs> that's us on this planet. We're, this cl we're these clever people, and we're sort of here, and like, what are we doing? What do we have to do? Um, there's a sense in which there's an agenda for culture now that's more clear than it's ever been. In the past, you know, we had technology for survival and culture maybe helped us on some levels. But now there's a new, very, very clear agenda for culture in a technological context. And that agenda is to make things of such seductive beauty that they distract us from mass suicide. And that's my conclusion.